Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Download the app. Share it with your friends. You can have access to all of our station's content, not just the front line with Joe and Joe. Remember, we are an EWTN affiliate, so you have all of that content also, and Joe and I, thanks to everybody out there. Uh, we're growing nicely on social media, and we really appreciate that. Uh, we're on Rumble, we're on Facebook, YouTube, and X. Really trying to build up Rumble and X. So you can find us at the Frontline TV on Rumble, and you can find us at, at with Joe and Joe uh, on X. Like I said, growing nicely. Got some these interviews that we do for Veritas. We uh, we put on there. We also Joe and I go live Thursday nights at nine o'clock, where we uh, really get into a lot of trouble and go into the breach. Um, you know, sooner or later, Facebook and YouTube will take us down, but X and Rumble won't. So uh, join us on any one of them, really, and like, subscribe, share. <laughs> do all that fun stuff uh it's always a pleasure to welcome back to the program a friend of the show michael grogan um and and michael's one of those guys he doesn't he doesn't like when you know when we kind of pat him on the back a little bit because he he has one of those virtues that we all need a little bit more of which is humility my hands raised okay because i need humility michael knows what he's doing he does just for god uh, and you'll understand that if you haven't listened to our prior interviews with Michael, uh, exactly what he's doing. And uh, so we're going to talk about reflections from below America's poverty line. See, people think about poverty in some abstract way. Michael doesn't do that because he's living right there below the pro poverty line with, with the people who are in the worst shape uh, in our society. And this needs to be addressed. You know, it seems like they want to address all sorts of things. OK, uh, but these things don't seem to get addressed in any effective way by the government. And they need to. Uh, if you're not familiar, Michael Grogan, he served the poorest of the poor. He lived amongst them, like I said, in the South Bronx. He's now in Philadelphia. He's been there for a couple of years. Uh, Michael's legally blind. OK, and that's that that's important to realize, again, talking about humility, the idea that you could do anything when when you do it for God. Michael's legally blind yet in so many ways. Michael has better vision than all of us uh, and broader than all of us. So welcome back, Michael, to the front line with Joe and Joe. It's always a pleasure, our brother. Thanks so much, Joe. Excited to be with you. Excited to see what God's going to do. That it's exactly right. Every time Joe and I sit in front of the computer, I really have to. I, lately, it's been in my head. It's like, okay, God's going to do something with this show. If He touches one people or or ten million people, some God's going to use this for His purposes. And let's try to get to people's hearts. I think a conversation like this, when you're talking about people who are really, really down and out, and Michael will describe that in a little bit. Uh, they need our prayers. More importantly, they need our actions. They need our help. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joe. We'll start with a prayer. And we'll have a great conversation. Michael, we already start with the prayer to Our Lady in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, for you we stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despised not our petitions, but in your clemency, hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. As Joe Pasil rightly said, Michael's been on the show before. Um, we've talked about his work in the South Bronx. We've talked about it in Philly. Uh, some changes have happened to his ministry. He's changed the name of the ministry. Um, it has grown. Thanks be to God. Uh, Michael is a friend of the show, as Joe said again, rightly, and he will always be a friend of this show. So we wanted to bring him back and you could talk about what's happening in Philly. He lives in a section of town called Kensington. It's known for fentanyl and heroin. Some of the worst issues with those cheap drugs uh, that are plaguing America. So, Michael, what's happening with the ministry? I know you guys are growing. And what's rocking in Kensington? Well, it, it's really been amazing. We um, uh, Just last year, we got 21 young people from the neighborhood. These are young people, some of them covered in tattoos, some of them former drug dealers, uh, some of them with prison records, baptized. And, uh, and that's what this is all about, bringing souls to Jesus. And um, the, the name of our ministry is I Thirst Ministry. And we're it's so inspired by the, the work of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who heard Jesus say to her personally, I thirst. I thirst for the souls of the poor. I thirst for someone to reach out to them and to carry me. Jesus said, carry me into the dark holes of the poorest of the poor. 
So I'm too wimpy to join the missionaries of charity because let me tell you, those are like those are like the Marines. <laughs> so in my own little way, I'm here. I'm in Philly and trying to do God's thing. Hopefully not my thing. I don't want to be singing my way on uh, at, at the judgment seat. Frank Sinatra, no offense, but I ain't singing that song at the judgment seat. I want to do it his way. No, absolutely. Michael Grogan is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Michael, let, let's talk about this. Some people look at the, now. If anybody out there wants to see what Kensington's like, go just go on YouTube and put Kensington, uh, pencil of uh, Kensington, Philadelphia, uh, in the uh, in the search bar, and just go look at a video. So there's people that have made videos out there just walking down the street with their camera on. Okay, and if you don't recognize that there is an issue, forget about what the politicians say. They use words like heroin and fentanyl just as talking points just to try to get our votes. We're talking about on the ground, okay? If you look at the shape these people are in, Michael, they're doing, they do things, th th these people, when you see them, it's not like back in the day, somebody smoked a joint and you knew that they were high and they're kind of a little loopy. These people are are, are contorted. They're, 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 they're laying up, standing against a wall, but, but completely asleep. It's, it's so heart-wrenching, okay? Um, and I, I guess my larger point is this, there's a lot of those people that are not from there. There's a lot of those people there that are from the suburbs. Okay. Who get involved with drugs when they're in their suburban high schools and things like that and end up in Kensington, either like in shape like that or dead on the street. Okay. What's going on. And again, we can't, we're not endorsing one political party or another, but we could certainly beat the crap out of the government for their lack of response when it comes to doing anything uh, about this. And it, 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 I'm going to throw it over to you, Mike. You know where I'm going. So t typically we see um, pe young people and, and, and middle-aged people um, who are using the drugs. They're coming in from middle-class and upper-class neighborhoods, coming into our neighborhood to get the cheap drugs, you a lot of times it started because they were on uh, subscription painkillers, and then the subscription was um, abruptly ended, and so they were on you know Percocets or OxyContin, couldn't get it anymore, uh, and came to Kensington because it was cheap. You know they could get it, and you know it's it's very expensive even on the streets to get an OxyContin, to get a Percocet, to get one pill. It's incredibly expensive, and so they find out that heroin is cheaper, and they end up. Uh, using heroin and from and the heroin is laced with fentanyl and and now this stuff called trank, and so we have hundreds and hundreds of young people and middle aged people, homeless people, vets, people in wheelchairs, people with one arm, one at one leg, um, and they're all so high. It like you said, it it's not just like they smoke a joint and they're kind of out there floating in space. Their bodies are contorted. They're standing, bent down with their hands on the ground. And, you know, in positions that you couldn't even that a great contortionist couldn't even get into. Uh, honestly, uh, sometimes it looks like the exorcist. The, the, the facial expressions are, are so demonic because the the drugs, um, the drugs are demonic. The drugs are from hell. And what happens is with the new stuff, with the trank, which is kind of like um, which is, is kind of like a, a sedative or a tranquilizer for for animals that's now being put into the laced into the heroin and into the fentanyl th their their flesh begins to rot so you literally are walking through the streets of Kensington when you walk past people you're smelling infection you're smelling death and you see that parts of their fingers and arms are rotting off that some of their faces are literally rotting off their noses um you don't know how many times i remember one time we made a big pot of chili and I had one of our young people, this is one of the kids who got baptized. He, he had been incarcerated and was in gangs and then, you know, ended up having a huge turnaround. And so we made a big pot of chili. I said, Nick, go bring this bowl of chili over to that guy. He was in a wheelchair. So he brought it and put it. He said the guy was like asleep or passed out. So I just left it with him. Well, the next day I got off the train and walked past same guy, same position. He was dead. He had been dead for 24 hours. We walked past so many people. One day I was taking a walk, praying the rosary with one of our partners. And as we were praying the rosary in the streets, we, we, we stumbled upon a scene. There was an ambulance and all these people gathered around. And they were, you know, trying to, you know, use CPR to get a guy back. And he died. They put the white cloth over him. We were there praying the rosary. 
So many, many, many times a day, and yes, I said a day, people are dying, like really dying, like not just like, you know, like we're all we're all dying. I'm dying right now, right? But I'm not dead. People are like literally in the streets in their final agony today, and they're dying of fentanyl and heroin and drug overdoses. There will be people today. Every time I see an ambulance, it's way different now. You know, you used to see an ambulance and you'd bless yourself. Uh, when I see an ambulance in Kensington, I realize that that some, you know, some grandmother, some mother who's begging God for the deliverance and the conversion of their children, some family member that's begging God, you know, it's happening right now. That soul is about to return to God. And so it's so important that we pray for them and that there are people, you know, out there doing ministry. And that's part of what I do. I, I do ministry uh, to the addicts just by being present and praying with them and for them. But my main ministry is not to the drug addicts. My main ministry is to the young people who are selling the drug addicts drugs. My main ministry is to the gang members. My main ministry is to the 15-year-old kid who's carrying a gun. And yes, I said that, not a toy, a gun with bullets. And he's pulled the trigger before. It's real. It's happening. I've now tuned it out. There are gunshots every day in my neighborhood. Every day. I used to be very sensitive to it. Now it's now it's like a you, you get desensitized because it's happening every day. This is beyond third world. I, I had a gentleman who uh, heard about us, and he and and so he said, "I'd like to come and do some volunteer work for you." He said, "I'm a, I'm a fix it guy." I can. I said, "Well, I got a leaky pipe pipe in the basement." He said, "I want to come and fix your leaky pipe." And so he drove and he brought tons of donations with him from St. Louis, Missouri. He drove to Kensington. And I said, you know, you, sir, I, I really, I'm grateful that you're coming, but this is not, you might not, no, we have a bad neighborhood in St. Louis. It's fine. I, I, I go to the bad neighborhood all the time and help out. I said, okay. I said, well, look up Kensington on YouTube. So, cause he watched the videos. He said, no, 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 I know. He came, he, the next day he said, he came one night, he made it. And he said, I, I need to leave. I cannot stay. I've never seen anything like this. Now he ended up staying till the weekend was over. You know, he said, I'm an old Navy guy and I signed up for this and we got to finish what we started. He said, I, I have never seen anything like this. He said, when I served, I served in Africa and, and I, I, I felt more safe there. This is so unsafe. And what I'm seeing is so unreal. So we cannot imagine that this is here in America. And the call of Jesus, so the question is, what is the call of Jesus? What are we called to do? Me, I'm called to be here. I know most people, your listeners are not called. They're not going to move into Kensington. That's okay. Mother Teresa said, I can do what you cannot do. And you can do what I cannot do. But together, we can do something beautiful for God. So let me shut up for a minute. Michael Grogan is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, Joe Russ and LOA in the breach. Mike, uh, what is the, um, the website or any social media where people could go and they could contribute to your ministry? ithirstministry.com ithirstministry.com so we would encourage everybody to go on there hey listen uh you know the remember remember the 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 widow's might okay she was more valuable than the than the rich man who put a million dollars into into the you know into the church okay and jesus tells us that give from your heart if you could give a dollar if you could give a hundred thousand dollars if you could give ten thousand dollars like michael said he could do what we can't OK, but we could do what he can't. All right. So we're out there. We we, 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 we we provide for our families. We have money that we give to the church and everything. It, 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 support Michael Grogan's ministry. Um, Joe, if you don't mind, let me stay with with Michael for, for a second. OK, because. Mike, I know what I would do if I was president of the United States. OK, one of the things I would do is um, because because these idiots in Washington, what they do is they've convinced us that they need to waste money. On, on on all of these things that you just you look at and you shake your head and say, why are you doing that when you have all these problems, particularly this problem? People don't think this is a national emergency. This is a national emergency. It's not just Philly. Joe and I are from Newark, okay? I remember talking to one of the Franciscan friars of the renewal when we were down at the friary in Newark, okay? And this was a guy similar to what you're talking about. He's been all over the world in the poorest of the poor places. He said the central ward in Newark is the worst place he's ever seen in his life. And it's obviously, you know, the same type of situation. You know what I would do? 
do, I would declare a national emergency. I, and again, I want your comment, all right, because I know I'm maybe being a little crazy, but I think you know where I'm going. Um, I would declare a national emergency. I would say if the if the cities are not going to turn around and send them the police, round up these drug dealers, throw them in jail. OK, hopefully they repent by listening to you, throw them in jail and, and prevent the drugs from getting there in the first place. OK, um, and a lot of people don't like that, but I don't care. Send in the National Guard and clean these places up and, and start to do something as far as holding these these cities accountable for the way that they neglect people. What is your view of what I just said? Because. They seem like I said to give it a lot of got a lot of lip service, but if you talk about Newark, that gentleman you mentioned from St. Louis, you talk about Detroit, you talk about Philadelphia, you talk about Chicago, you talk about all uh, pockets of the five boroughs in New York City, it looks the same, and nobody's doing a damn thing except trying to get elected off it. And I know I'm getting angry, but it's an anger because you're looking at people destroying themselves, and it's kind of just you know whatever you can say to get somebody's vote about it. And, but you're not really you're not doing anything. You're not actually doing something mm. well certainly a good day a good a good day of cleanup would be great uh one fell sweep but you know until people's hearts and minds are changed let me tell you they'll just be the next set of 15 16 17 year old kids that are looking for a quick buck that will rise up and do it and so the so the drugs need to the drug flow needs to be totally stopped you got to cut it at the roots right so that's where the border and the cartels we got you got to cut it at the roots um that that's the one thing you know it's like you know you got to get to the root cause of sin you know you got to get the root cause that's really the roots kind of are at the border i think but um but the other thing is i think the church could do more than the government and i think that we i i you know i was i was telling joe before the show i think we get so caught up and it's good we get so caught up in the corporal works of mercy you know that we're not but we can forget again you got to get to the root and the root is to admonish the sinner, right? And the root is to bring these people to Jesus. And the root is for the church, you know, just like, you know, that Eucharistic procession in Indianapolis was so amazing. And there were, you know, like thousands of religious, well, but that, but that shouldn't be once every five years. That should be like all the time. We need to be, the church needs to be the city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, you know? The church needs to use her voice. You know, um, we need to be present out in the streets. God bless the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, who, although we don't we don't agree with them and, and they, they don't have the fullness of what we have, and we say that with all humility, we should be knocking on doors. We should be evangelizing. We should be out giving rosaries and medals to people, talking with people, praying with people, inviting them to church, um, stirring up their hunger. We are so complacent as a church. That yes, the government can do something, but it's up to us to change the hearts. And because the government's never going to work to change the hearts of people. No, and that's right. what this is all about. This is about conversion. This is all about conversion. And so Mike, I go. Gonna... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Let me let you finish. Go I go to my little corners where I am and I start talking with people and I give them beautiful rosaries, not cheap plastic ones, the expensive ones. Because these are sons and daughters of God who don't know that they're sons and daughters of God. They believe a lie. They believe they're bastards. They believe that there is no father. They believe that they are fatherless. And some of them have literally, I, some of them have tattoos of Satan on their arms. They've embraced another father. Some of them believe that, you know, they don't belong to God. And so when somebody comes and begins to, and gives them a rosary and tells them about their dignity and their worth, and says a prayer with them, and then gives them little sacramentals. Just yesterday, I gave a drug dealer holy water, and I'm and he's using it. I taught him how to use it. I said, because they're Puerto Rican, they think they should take a bath in it. I said, no. I said, take a little bit on your finger, and just make the sign of the cross on your forehead, and bless yourself. And then he took it, and he was making the sign of the cross over the other drug dealers. Yes. And so you think that's a little thing. But that's how conversion starts. It's the first domino that falls. And so when you watch this stuff happening, and then they're coming to me, you know, I give them the scapulas and say, if you wear the brown scapula, Our Lady promises, you know, that she's going to come at the hour, that she's going to be with you, that you will not suffer the eternal flames of hell. So they don't remember the name of it. They say, can you give me the hell thing? So I say, it's really the heaven thing, right? Because it gets it's, it's, it, it will get them there possibly the long way. They may end up in purgatory. But... <laughs> I'll you be know, there, Mike. <laughs> Evangelize, bring souls to Jesus. 
and I, we talk a lot about it and people and my brothers and sisters, this is a, a gentle admonition to everyone listening. We listen and we say, yay, what good work. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, but this is your work. You who are listening right now, this is your this is your call. Maybe not to the drug dealer in the street, but to your employees at work to be a little bit more bold. We're so passive about evangelization while souls are going to go to hell. We're very passive about it. We got to work harder. Can't say, well, our, our priest, no, me, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It's you, it's me. We have to bring, what you know, I, I know it's corny, but I once heard this guy say at one of these men's movements things, you know, who is the church? If you, if you take the two letters out between the CH and the CH of church, it's you are. You're the church. You're members of the mystical body. It's your responsibility. You're your brother's keeper. You have to get out there. You have to be bold for Jesus. Be bold for souls. This is really a cry. You know, we can say the government. We can say the church. We could say the bishop, the priest. But it's got to start. What have you done to bring Absolutely. today? Today. And then what are you going to do tomorrow? Not just, oh, this week I gave a dollar to somebody in Manhattan. No good. Sorry. No good. Well, that's why, well, that, but that's what we were saying. Like, so that's why we have to support. See, and again, I'm not, you know, there, we, we give to our parishes. Of course, we should. Our, our, you that's can our tithe parish. to me. I'm a Catholic ministry. Right, well, well that, I mean, yes, but th then we should set aside, you know, if I give to you, I'm also giving to the church. If I give to the Sisters yes. of Life, I'm giving to the church. If I give to the Franciscan Sisters of Renewal, we're giving to the church, okay? You're giving from your heart what you can. Michael Grogan, real quick, uh, because I want to get into I want to throw it over to Joe before the break. Um, the ministry again, I Thirst. I Thirst Ministry dot com. And I want to say one more thing. If you were investing in the stock market, you would invest in up and coming companies. And so if you're investing in the kingdom of God and you see ministries and you see religious communities like the Missionaries of Charity, the Sisters of Life, the Franciscans of the Renewal, God willing, I Thirst Ministry that are bearing fruit, you see fruit on the investment, that's where you should invest. That's where you should tithe. Put your money where it's going to do the most damage to hell. Well, you you, you said it yourself. You, you get 21 baptisms since the last time we spoke. Absolutely right. I'm going to say right now, and, and I believe me, um, I'm, I, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm, I, I don't, I don't make a lot of money. Okay. Uh, I really don't. I'm committing right now. So everybody listening at the Veritas Catholic radio network and everybody out there who's watching this on social media. All right. I'm at least to start, I'm committing 20 bucks a month when I do my bills to Michael's ministry. I'm going to go on the website. I'm going to put in my credit card and I'm going to do a recurring payment of 20 bucks a month. This way I can you know, I want to be able to help. I want to be able to help my friend bring friends that I don't know to Jesus, Joe Resinello. Ultimately, the best uh, charities are grassroots charities, hand-to-hand. -hand. And what Michael's doing is hand-to-hand -hand helping the poor. But ultimately, Michael sees the poor in a different way because he sees Jesus in them. And that's not self-manufactured. That only comes through living a sacramental life, having a daily prayer life, fasting regularly. This is something I, I write about constantly because it's true. We have to see Jesus. The interesting thing of what's going on in Kensington, because this is how sadly a lot of people operate. I'm not pointing fingers, but I have eyes. People only care about up to their front door. If it's not in their house, they don't care. But this is now affecting every neighborhood. As Michael said, people who you wouldn't think are addicted to heroin now are. But even still, they're not next to you. So it's easy to compartmentalize and forget about these people. In a sense, we're almost committing what uh, like the original ideas of Planned Parenthood, like it's like a eugenic idea. We're calling the population. These people are no good. Get rid of them because it doesn't affect me. This is not the mindset of God. And this can't be the mindset of Catholics. That's not what Jesus did. And that's what we can't do. But before we do that, we have to have the vision of Christ. Talk about that, Michael, obtaining the vision of God, because without that, we're not going to see these people having value and we're not going to want to help them. Michael, I got about three minutes before the break. So if I have to cut you off, we'll pick it up on the other side of the break. OK. Okay, so very simply, Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. 
And he wasn't thirsting for water. He was thirsting for love. And every single soul that's created has a unique, special love that only they can return to God. Michael Grogan has a love inside of him that only he, nobody else from Adam and Eve to the very last person that ever exists will ever be able to give God this love, this Michael Grogan love that is so unique only to me. There's never been anything like it. And so it's such a, it's, we short God when we don't give him our love. And so for us as Christians, our job is to get people, these unique, precious, unrepeatable souls that are worth every drop of the blood of Jesus. Jesus poured out every drop. This is my body given up for you, singular. And so each person, that drug addict in the street, that drug dealer on the corner with a ski mask on and a gun in his pocket, they are worth every single drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I want Jesus to get what he paid for. I want Jesus to get what he paid for. He paid for my love. He paid for their love. And not 10%, not 50% of it, all of it. So praying for the salvation of souls isn't enough. It's praying for the sanctification of souls and working for that and giving our all to that, being committed to that personally and being committed to being a missionary, a carrier of God's love through the streets. And when you have eyes that see each soul like that as bought with the blood, as worth every drop of the blood, then you're not afraid. Some people say, I don't feel led. I, I didn't feel led to talk to that one. Go get a piece of lead from the hardware store, put it in your pocket, and every time you don't feel lead, stick your hand in your pocket, touch the lead, and go bring Jesus to souls. No, I, listen, I, I, that's actually, I love that. But if you stick your hand in your pocket, you feel, you'll feel lead then. All right, then get moving. Um, I thirst ministry.com is Michael's website. And we want to encourage everyone out there. Um, again, we all, we're all in our lane at the moment. And when God decides to make, you know, move you into a different lane, uh, you, 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 you'll, you know, you go into that lane right now, uh, Joe and I, we're, we you know, we're working guys, we have families, we're doing it. So, we, but we can do something to help Michael, uh, to help his ministry, to do exactly what he's saying. And again, we see the fruit, Michael, and you, you, your ministry has grown so much in the, in the several times over the last several years that we've spoken to you, right? Your ministry, the fruit is there. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. 21 souls that get baptized, a drug dealer that takes holy water and blesses his gang member buddies. Um, I, I mean, this is, this is the work <laughs> of the Holy Spirit and we have to do what we have to do. We can only do what we can. And God knows that. So let's pony up a few bucks every month. All right. And, 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 uh, and give to Michael, give to his ministry. I thirst ministry.com. We're going to take a quick break here at the front line with Joe and Joe, um, uh, on the Veritas Catholic radio network, 1350 on your AM dial 103.9 on your FM dial. I implore everyone out there, please share this video. Please share this video. Okay. Michael is in, he's, he's, he goes into the breach. Joe and I say we go into the breach. Michael's literal. It's a literal statement. He's in the breach. He's in a place that is 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 broken, and that's where the war is. And he's bringing souls to Jesus Christ. Uh, so please share this video so we could we could touch someone else's heart, and they could touch someone else's heart. Um, and and do something to help. So Michael Grogan's with us for another half hour. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, Joe Resinello. We were way in the breach with Michael Grogan, and we're discussing his ministry, ithirstministry.com. Michael is living below the poverty line uh, in Philadelphia. He's bringing souls, people who have ruined their lives or are in the process of ruining their lives, and he's helping them come to Jesus and, and, and not, only, not only restore their lives in this world, but obviously uh, help them to know that they're going, they're, there is a much better place in the next, and Jesus wants you there with him so we're happy as always to have michael on the show joe if you don't mind i just want to start with something okay sure, sure. Um, saint augustine famously wrote uh lord my heart is restless until it rests in thee michael we're all restless okay everybody to one degree or another they have you know the things that we become addicted to it could be scrolling on your phone it could be cigarettes it could be alcohol it could be drugs you're obviously dealing in a place where the central the central problem uh is drugs but ultimately it's all a restlessness uh, these people who you say have Satan on their arm, they're simply restless and they're, they're obviously they're misguided. They're looking in the wrong direction. Um, but what they want is God. 
people talk talk about the message of telling people who have again every, nobody's perfect all right and we all need to break our nasty habits and addictions okay but ultimately we have those because we're trying to fill the hole that god wants to fill in us um comment on that if you don't mind well our hearts are restless until they rest in god it's 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 really true and and I see it because, you know, as soon as you start talking about Jesus, as soon as, like, you know, as soon as you start telling stories, as, you know, people say, well, how do you start with a drug dealer? How do you start with the gang members? What do you do? And usually a very nice sacramental, so a miraculous medal, or a nice rosary, or a brown scapular. And then to begin to share some stories, and let me tell you, we are the mystical body of Christ. As soon as you start sharing Stories about the mystics, Padre Pio, stories about God's providence, stories about exorcisms. They are like eating out of your hand because they're so hungry for God. And then they'll start to share about somebody that they know who was killed. And so they talk, you know, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll say, do you think this one's in hell? And you start talking about death, judgment, heaven, hell, mercy, forgiveness, repentance, baptism, and then they say, well, I'm not baptized. And you start sharing about that. And then you talk about prayer. So so they're, the poor are so humble. The poor, you know, even though they're broken and they're living sinful lives, they were raised in it. Some of these young people, I mean, I have eight, I have kids who, when they, were, when they were eight years old, were smoking marijuana with their mom and dad. You know, are they evil? Or did they, were they just raised, this is all that they knew? And so I have a lot of empathy and you don't know how many of the people that I work with say to me, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. If we could all come to prayer with that, you know, oh, I can pray, I'll pray. They come, so they know they're poor before God. They know that before God, they are poor. And that, and so they come with that humble predisposition, that humble contrite heart. They know that they know inherently, you know, it's just through the natural law that they're sinners. I had a young man come to me the other day. And he said, God can't forgive me. God can't forgive me. On and on he went. And I said, no, God can forgive you. It's you who can't forgive you. And I said, you think that your pile of dirt is bigger than God. The difference between you and me is you think your pile of dirt is bigger than God. I think God is way bigger than your little pile of dirt. And, and so he started to laugh and we started to talk about it. And I, I, I believe that this person that I'm talking about probably committed a murder. And I, I told him, get to the back of the line in Kensington because he's not the first murderer that I've met here and he won't be the last. And so, and I told him, I said, you know, before you commit a sin, the devil's given you every excuse in the book. It's not a big deal. He did you wrong. He did you dirty. You deserve this. You got it coming to you. I said, and after you commit the sin, immediately after, you did what? You're so terrible. You're never going to be saved. God can't forgive you. You're such a horrible person. I said, he goes from the excuser to the accuser real quick. And so the kid is sitting there eating out of the palm of my hand because this is what he's really going through. And so when you learn to talk to people and bring the gospel to people right where they're at, you see that beautiful hunger open up for God. They are so hungry for Jesus. And it's, a, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I got to just speak from my own experience and I never went through what these people are going through. But believe me, we, like I said, we all have our own addictions. OK. And, you know, uh, in another life a long time ago, you know, I had that attitude. It's like, well, I, you know, I used to pass the church. I, I got to go to confession thinking in my mind that, well, is God really going to forgive me? I like it was a, like a whole process. I had to go through in my head. Uh, and then one day I and obviously it was God woke me up and 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 and, and I found the confessor and I went to confession um, and and. I, I know people might find this hard to believe, but this is the story of conversion, all right, or reversion uh, in my case. God will God will change you like that in a, in a heartbeat if you ask. Me. It only takes some time, most of the time, because we're resistant. But if we even take the first step, okay, God will take us along the way. And God willing, we meet people like Michael Grogan, who's joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, because he's the one you know that that that's helping us. As Jesus commanded, that we're supposed to we're supposed to help. You know, we're supposed to help. Uh, our brothers and sisters, Joe Resinello. Mike, on the other side of the break, you talked about a gentleman who came in from St. Louis to help you. Uh, he was a guy who was in the Navy. He talked about some of the neighborhoods <laughs> he worked with in uh, 
St. Louis. I know East St. Louis is a very bad place. It's always one of the murder capitals of the world. But then he got to Kensington and he said, this is the worst place I've ever seen. Um, you're a white guy, you're blind, um, and you're living in a war zone. How do you do it? Have you had problems? Like, have you been assaulted? Do people leave you alone? Do they bother you? Um, because I'll be honest with you, I have sight. I'm a white guy. I wouldn't do what you did <laughs> and do. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't get off. You mentioned you were on the train. I don't I don't go on the subway in New York City. I'm sure as heck not going on the train in Kensington. Uh, do people assume you have money? Do they try to rob you? Because drug addicts aren't thinking in, you know, right. Their, their mind is on something else. I mean, have you had issues? Since I've moved to Kensington, um, my house has been robbed and they've stolen everything when I was away. I came back and there were three drug addicts living in my house. I had to get them out alone. Since I've moved into Kensington, I had a bullet fly right past my head, a real bullet from a real gun. I was almost Donald Trump. I almost got shot in the ear. Okay, literally. I mean, it was right past. I couldn't believe it. I had the phone in the other ear and a bullet was passed this year at three o'clock in the afternoon across the street from a school. I've been shot twice in the face with a pellet gun. I have been punched off the train for praying my rosary quietly to myself. This ain't safe. You know, I remember when I was reading St. Paul, I used to hear, you know, I've been shipwrecked. I've been this, I've been that I've been beaten. And I'm like, what a drama queen. No more. <laughs> I get it, St. Paul. I get it. So this ain't easy. Um, and and I wouldn't I wouldn't stay unless it was for the call of Jesus. It's like I, I really believe that Jesus wants me here. But I walk out the house and I'm very aware I have my brown scapular on and I have my rosary on. And, you know, I, I say my prayers. And how, so how do you do it is the question. You, you know, one, you believe. You really believe what I said before the break, that every soul is worth the precious blood of Jesus, that I'm in the missions. I'm lucky I'm in the missions, but I get to go visit my family in Long Island once in a while. So I get a little break. I'm not in Africa. So that's good. I, you know, I'm in the missions. Every soul is worth every drop of the blood of Jesus. And I pray and I, I cling to my rosary. I say my divine office. I get to mass. I spend time with Jesus in the Eucharist. And the main thing is that I pray with young people. I pray with gang members. I, every Friday night and Sunday night, they come and they pray with me. And some of them literally come from selling drugs. And it's not my, I'm just happy that they're praying the rosary. And I know Our Lady is too. And I, and I know Our Lady has them on the hook. And she's reeling up the hook. You know, we're catching fish. And so when I see them praying the rosary, when I see them, we pray night prayer from the Liturgy of the Hours. And without the book, with the candles lit and the incense going, they're singing as good as any seminarian, covered in their tattoos with their afros. It makes it all worth it for that split second. And then they leave and I say, I'm back. But just for those little ecstatic moments that God gives that keep me here, because, you know, I always say when I write, I write a newsletter once a month. And, and if you go on to ithirstministry.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. And it's hard. When you write a newsletter, you got you to gotta tell people all the good things that happened that month. But for every one good thing, there's 100 bad things. So what, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll write, this is not going to be a typical newsletter because I want people to know that this is, you know, there's a band called Guns and Roses. Okay, that's what I would describe in, you know, Guns and Roses. Okay, that's what this is. Michael Grogan is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Please go on his website, subscribe to, I didn't know that you have a newsletter on there, put in your email. You'll get the, uh, you'll get Michael's newsletter. I thirst ministry.com. Uh, and yeah, pony up a few bucks, uh, do a recurring payment, uh, you know, do like once a month. And I've already pledged in the last segment, I'm going to do 20 bucks a month. To, and if I make more money, God willing, then I'm going to give Michael more. But in the meantime, I'm going to give what I have. Mike, let me ask you this. Um, we forget that even in places like that, they listen, obviously the people that live there are very, very poor. You're not in Kensington because you could, you could afford to leave, live even in just a little bit of a nicer neighborhood. Okay. Um, so I'm sure you, and not all those people, of course, are addicted to heroin or fentanyl or anything else. They're just trying to get up every day and, 
do what they can to survive, better their station in life, uh, hopefully financially, do something. How are they? Uh, what is there, the people that you interact with that perhaps are trying to help you or whatever? How are they? Uh, what is their reaction to the things that you do? Uh, how are, you know, have you relationships with a lot of the people that are just simply living in that neighborhood? It, it took a long time to build trust. I have to tell you, when I was in the Bronx, I, I in the, the first month, I was best friends with everybody in the neighborhood. It, it took me about two years here. Um, part of it was because I came in at the tail end of COVID. Right. And so there was, you know, there's a distrust because you're in Kensington. And then there's the additional distrust because you might be sick and killing people. Right. And so it, it took a while. But the people in the neighborhood now love me and I love them and they know why I'm here. They know for whom I am here. They know that I'm here for Jesus. I am not a social worker. I do not run around giving out food and Band-Aids all day. That's not what I do. I'm here to pray with people. So I, I yes. There is um, a level where we're doing the corporal works of mercy. I give food to low-income families if I have it, but kind of they get to know that I get some some food donations and they'll call and say I need. So it's not like I have a line. I don't want to be food or us. Once a month, in fact, this Saturday uh, coming up, we have the first Saturday devotion. We have mass in our house and confessions and rosary, and that's for volunteers that want to come. And then they go out and they do some community service work. It could be with the homeless. It could be home visits. And we have volunteers that come and get involved and help and kind of come and see. Typically, you know, from the tri-state area, they'll come. We get about a dozen or 18 people and then feed them a hot meal. But what we do is always centered on prayer or Jesus or the sacraments or evangelization. That's really, we're here for souls. And the people in the neighborhood know that. They know that if they come, they're coming for a prayer group. They know that this is not, there are other places that do the corporal works of mercy. We do that on a very limited, very limited level. We are here for one purpose and for one purpose only. It's very, it's very radical evangelization. I mean, like I said, it's incredible. Joe Resinello, where do you want to go? You've lived in rough neighborhoods a good part of your life, Michael. Can neighborhoods turn around? When people talk about like regentrification, like Hoboken, I can remember when I was a kid, I'm dating myself, I'm 54 years old, was rough when I was like a teenager. Now Hoboken is like for millionaires. Uh, it changed. How could a neighborhood like Kensington change outside of yuppies? Because uh, that's what you always hear. You know, the yuppies move in. Um, and then the neighborhood goes from rags to riches and no one could live there anymore. And then everyone gets priced out. Can yeah. a neighborhood like Kensington or the South Bronx change? In your view, you live there, you'll know, you know. The, the South Bronx definitely has changed. Parts of it have really come up. Um, you know, definitely when I first started there, it was horrible. And I, and I definitely watched, I definitely watched it come up. There's still um, the projects and low income housing and everything that goes on there will continue to go on there. It's, it, it is, it, it is what it is, human nature. And then there are these little sparks of light, like the Franciscans and the missionaries of charity that go, but yes, neighborhoods can change. Um, but Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And the, that's that doesn't change. And, and, you know, poverty is not just like, oh, well, I don't have enough money in my bank account. It's a social capital poverty that they, you know, I always I talk to my kids about social capital. I said, you know, you're going to be who, the five people you hang out with. That's going to be who you are. So, why don't, you know, why don't you step up your game a little bit? Because if you hang out with five drug dealers, like, are you a drug dealer? You know, it, it, duh. You know, and I kind of talk to them like that and we laugh. You know what I mean? And I said, so why don't you step up your game? Why don't you talk to hang out with kids who are working or who are in school or, you know, to, to build up and then get to know, you know, the next step up. Um, and so I also encourage that. I encourage, you know, a lot of the guys that are selling drugs have, do have an entrepreneurial. They don't want to work for anybody. That sounds that's why an entrepreneur becomes an entrepreneur. You know, they want to have follow their own rules. They want to make money. They like cash. Those are those things are not necessarily bad things. Those are all good things. It's just the line of work that they got into, right? So uh, to encourage them to find creative ways, and some of my guys actually over the summertime stopped stopped selling drugs and just went and they got and I helped them. We got just tons of cases of water, and they put it on ice and they went on Aramingo Avenue and they sold more water than they did weed, 
And I was so happy. They came home with so much cash in their pockets and they got so excited. It was a little thing, but it was, you know, it's beautiful to just to encourage that. So how do you take, you know, how do you take the good? Because it's not, okay, they're selling drugs. That's bad. But what's what's good in that? The good is that they 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 want to provide for their families. They want to do good things. They want to have nice things. Like it's not wrong to want to have a nice pair of sneakers. You know, they they want good things. So to take the good out of it, because that's what I do when I talk with them. I don't just say selling drugs is bad. You're going to hell. I say, well, I know that you want to help your family. And I know that you I, I say 10 good things before we get to the one bad thing that we need to tweak, you know. And so in fanning into flame that entrepreneurial spirit and, and, and encouraging them to use their gifts, to redirect their gifts, that's all also part of what I do, that good conversation and changing not only the heart, but changing the mind. Absolutely. Michael Grogan is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. He is living below the poverty line in Kensington, uh, Pennsylvania, which is a section of Philadelphia. And we're discussing his ministry, I Thirst Ministry. Dot com. Michael is a friend of the show. Please share this video. This is this is a really good conversation that people need to hear. And I know conversations, uh, Michael, about drugs, uh, videos about like things like this. A lot of people get turned off. They don't want to see it. I, I think we need to force people to see it and come to the reality that, especially in America, where so many people call themselves Christian. Christian, you can't turn your eye to that. You can't turn you can't turn away from that. That is your responsibility. Jesus is going to hold all of us. All of us accountable. And that's why I said earlier, if well, if you say, well, but I got a family, I got to get up, I got to go to work. Good. Michael's doing it. Go on ithirstministry.com and help him to do it. Now, this is where I'm going with this, with the help aspect of this. Um, I'm sure you have some help. Um, you know, uh, it's not just you flying solo, but let's talk about the church uh, or any help that you, you know, that you want to talk about that you get, let's say, uh, from, uh, from, from friends and other people but also the presence of the church um, in Kensington, the priests on the ground, perhaps a religious order of sisters on the ground. Uh, what, is, what Paint that picture for us, if you, if you will, Mike. The, 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 the help has been amazing. I just want to share one thing. It's beautiful. Um, St. Joseph has been so good to us. And uh, so shout out to St. Joseph. And let me tell you, if you don't have a strong devotion to St. Joseph, and I didn't, by the way, but um, in December of 2023, I got the inspiration. I said, I, I've been renting a house for four years. We really need to buy a property at this point. Stop making our landlords, stop sending them to the Dominican Republic. Let somebody else send them there. I want to I I have a house. And so I got the inspiration in December, and we started a little fundraising campaign. And by mid-January, we had raised all of the money to not have a mortgage to purchase a house in Kensington for $220,000. And St. Joseph did that. We prayed, we prayed. And so we raised about 70 grand. And then all of a sudden somebody came in, an anonymous gentleman, and he said, I want to, I want to give you the rest that you need for the house so that you can do ministry in Kensington. So he wired us the money. He said, I have one condition that you consecrate your house to the holy face of Jesus. I said, I will consecrate the house to anybody you want, but Satan for a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and so, and so we got the house, we got it. Now we got it up February 28th. So the inspiration came at the end of December, February 28th. I had the keys and the deed in my hand and March 23rd, we moved in after doing some work. And, um, and it has been so amazing to watch. And so we're here, we're here for, we're here for the long haul to bring Jesus to souls. And we're not alone. The church is here. And the Capuchins are present. The Capuchin Franciscans, they're beautiful. They're on the ground. They go out, they serve the poor. The Sisters of Life are not far away. Mother Teresa's sisters, although they do not have a house yet in Kensington, we pray one day they will, um, they send sisters from the Bronx and Washington, D.C. and Norristown. So three or four times a week, different houses of sisters are out here, literally on the ground, serving the poor, praying with the poor, walking the streets, being present. Um, and there are other small nonprofits that do things. They're not necessarily under the church, but they're Catholic and their their mission is Catholic, but they're not, you know, they're not like under the archdiocese. That's kind of where I fall. I'm not under the church, 
um, but I work with the church and I'm Catholic and our mission is to bring souls into the Catholic church. Um, and so there's a lot of people out here, a lot of heroic people that every day there's a, there's a little place called Sarnelli House. They feed 150 people a day. And, and the, again, there's a lot of feeding and that's all important and clothing. And we don't belittle that because Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. But our, our particular emphasis here, since we see all those needs kind of can be met in other places, is in praying with and bringing souls into the kingdom and helping them to know their worth, and especially gang members and drug dealers. So th the difference is you might, if you're walking down Kensington Avenue, you're going to walk past people that are contorted, and then you're going to walk past another guy with a ski mask on. That's the guy Michael Grogan's going to go talk with, that guy, and pray with and try to bring back and get them into school and help them to get a job and pray the rosary with them and hopefully bring them into the church. And you know something? I re I'm convinced in 10 years when we talk, we're going to have one or two guys in the seminary. I, I already, I got one in my mind. I really believe God's calling them. He's a miracle. Kid's a miracle. So you'll see God's hand is at work. Absolutely. Michael Grogan joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe, we got time probably. For, we got a few more minutes. Where do you want to go with Michael to, to finish the conversation? I just want to make a quick comment and then I'll throw a question. I mean, Michael's been on the show a number of times. I knew Michael uh, with the Missionaries of Charity uh, many years ago. Michael, you're focused. Honestly, uh, just by what you just said, like, like you know what you're doing. And people should pick up on that because I do. When I hear you, you're not all over the place. You have a mission statement and any good and effective organization has one and you do. And that's why this will succeed also because it's rooted in prayer and rooted in God and God will help you just like he got you a house. So people should take <laughs> note of that. You know what I'm saying? You tell a tree by the fruit it bears. Michael knows what he's doing. Michael's focused. Michael's going to get it done. Be a part of it. That's point one. Point two, America needs Jesus. America needs Jesus. Not just Kensington, America. We have to be his hands and feet in the world. Michael, how do we bring Christ to America? Not just to Kensington, outside the walls of your city. Our Lady at Fatima said one thing. Pray the rosary every day and there will be peace in the world. Catholics, we need to listen to your mother. Pray the rosary every single day for peace in the world. Pray the rosary every day for our country. You know, there's 50 Hail Marys in the 50, you know, in, in the five decades, one for each state. That's so beautiful. They do the patriotic rosary. But to pray the rosary, the power of prayer. And if you're already doing the rosary, maybe it's time to double up. Don't be complacent anymore. You know, if you, you know, it only takes 15, 20 minutes to do a rosary, maybe do one in the morning, one in the evening, you know, but it's so important that we pray. The next thing is that we fast. What can we fast from? You know, maybe I'm not, I'm not a great, I like my food. I like my soak, soda. I like my things like that. How about fasting from social media, fasting from texting, you know, so that we have more time to spend with each other. Um, but to fast on some level, pray and fast. And then the last thing that I would say it's so important is to be very intentional and deliberate about evangelization. And that doesn't mean to invite another person who already comes to a prayer group to come with you to the prayer group. That's cheating. That's nice. But it's to invite the person who doesn't come to the prayer group to the prayer group. It's to, it's to be thoughtful, have masses offered for people, for the conversion of people, not just for the dead, but for the living. It's also have ministry for the souls in purgatory. Get the Gregorian masses for someone you love, you know, but to be thoughtful, to be kind, to be generous with our time, talent, and treasure, and to talk with people about God. And how do you do that effectively? Learn about the mystics. Learn about Padre Pio. Learn about modern-day miracles and Eucharistic miracles. People love the supernatural. Learn about that stuff. Listen to these, you know, there's so many priests on YouTube now who are involved with the exorcism ministry. Listen to some of that, not just so that you can learn, but also so that you can share. Um, share share what you have. Share your knowledge. Share your love for Jesus. Don't be afraid to say the name of Jesus publicly. Pray when you go out to eat. Pray. Make the sign of the cross and say a prayer. Even if nobody else at the table does, be bold. Be courageous. Absolutely. 
I will say this as far as, uh, you know, trying to get out there. Sometimes you, 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 you like, cause some people might say, well, how do I do that? I'm just going to walk down the street. No, you got groups out there. Um, like, uh, I think, uh, St. Paul street evangelization is one group. Um, I, I know they're here. I'm sure they're in other places in your, in your diocese. There are people that will go to places like Kensington or places in Newark down here. It's down in Phoenix, down in the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, downtown Phoenix, they set up a table, they put up a sign. People know who they are. People come to them, Mike, they come to them. You want to know why? Cause in the name of your ministry. I thirst, but they're talking about themselves. They are thirsting and they don't know it. Why else would you stop and talk to somebody who's pre- who has a sign there of Jesus? Because you want to know more. So you, people can get involved. There's plenty of there's plenty of ministries out there where people actually just, they go up, they set up a table on the street. I knew a priest that uh, back uh, was, was my wife's spiritual director when we were still in Brooklyn. Uh, he would go down to the gay pride parade, okay, set up a table. This was the gay pride parade in Newark, uh, excuse me, in New York. He'd set up a table, say, I'm a Catholic priest. If you'd like to talk, sit down. You know, and he would and he would talk to people. Um, you know, he would be like on one of the side streets where people going by and people would sit there and they talk to me, do exactly what you're saying. He's bringing them to Jesus. They're not going to convert on the spot, but you're planting a seed. Michael Grogan, one more time, your uh, your your website, what people can find there, where they could give the whole nine yards. Ithirstministry.com. Subscribe to our newsletter at least, and you're always welcome to give. And may the Lord bless you. And if you're writing a check, you know, there's two L's in a million. Um, but then the other the, the other thing I just want to say is we're, for evangelization, buy miraculous medals, scapulas, rosaries. People love to receive a gift. So when you give, when you go to the cashier at McDonald's, when you go to the cashier and they're thoughtful and friendly and kind at the end, say, oh, this is for you. This is the Blessed Mother. She loves you. You don't have to give a whole big speech about the history of the miraculous medal. Mother of Jesus loves you. That's it. Simple. And give when you give when you're thoughtful. People love little. The sacramentals are so powerful, it it they change lives. So get lots of sacramentals, and you'll be a great evangelist. And then just be thoughtful. Give. Don't mm-hmm. forget. Give it to the bus driver. Give it to the Uber driver. Give. 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 Simple one sentence explanation. Jesus loves you. Here, I'm praying for you. Pray for me too. Don't just say I'm <laughs> praying for you. You need their prayers. Okay. Michael, we love you, Michael. We're, we're here for you all the time. You know, this is your platform. We're so thrilled that you get, you know, when you come on the show, and we always have a great conversation. Michael Grogan, thank you again, brother. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. You got it. And thank you all out there for joining us here on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Thanks once again. And remember, until the next time, that our conversation is your conversation, and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.